Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School, and I just want a quilt. So today we talked to Pam Weeks. She's a curator at the New England Quilt Museum. She is a friend. She is a colleague. She is amazing. She um, was one of our first interviews um, when we began this project. We did a background interview with her last year um, for about three hours. Um, and so now we talk with her on the first year anniversary of the project. Um, it's, so um, we're preserving these for the Quilt Alliance. So this is Pam Weeks and Elizabeth Townsend Guard, and we're talking on the first anniversary of the project. And the project, Just Want a Quilt, before it was really Just Want a Quilt, began last summer. And I think I had interviewed two people before I had gotten to your house. And then you oh. told me a lot of things. And when I reviewed that, that beginning basic background um, interview... I couldn't believe how much we had gotten to in the year. How many of the people, how many of the issues. Um, you really sort of got the project started in a really um, significant way. So oh, I wanted yeah, to thank cool. you for that. That was huge. Huge. I've never felt so important in my life. No, really, you are. You're like this anchor to our project <laughs> in this huge way, right? Because you really gave it um, direction and thoughtfulness. And um, it was. And you invited us into your home, and we had we ate <laughs> that was certainly we great lunch. we did we had a lunch it was good so where are we since i last saw you when we were roommates at quilt market we have interviewed 150 people holy cow yeah we have launched the podcast which we did in february we've been up for yep. five months We've had, I can't, don't know the stats, but we're at like over 60,000 people either downloading it or streaming it or like that's a lot. So um, we get it between 400 and 800 people listening per episode. And um, it's exhausting. It's great. It's been a really great year, but um, it's kind of amazing how much, I mean, there's more to do and more to learn, but we're starting uh-huh. to see patterns that are really interesting. And um, and then Quilt Folk came. That was amazing. We're going to have mm-hmm. a booth at Quilt Festival in Houston. Um, no kidding. Yeah. Festival, not market. Yeah, not market. Yeah. Um, and we're I'm doing two lectures and a workshop at Quilt Con. Um, awesome. It's just Where growing. is it this year, Elizabeth? It's crazy. Where's Quilt Con this year? Nashville. Nashville. Nashville next year. Yeah. And we yeah, have. I am. In- are you going to go to QuiltCon? I am. You are. Are you? I haven't. I haven't been for two years, so it's time to go again. Oh well, good. Very good. And you're going to Quilt Market too. I am. Oh, good. I'm very glad. Um, so where are we? We're trying to figure out what we should do next. So we've learned a lot about the industry. I think there's a bunch of stuff. So first, I think we need to do more history and get m- more into that. Um, we interviewed Barbara Brackman. We interviewed Xenia Cord. Um, yep. But we haven't done a lot yet on that. So I think that's one of the next areas, and I'd love for your advice and thoughts about that. Um, okay. And the museums. We've done uh, we've done exhibits at museums, and I went to the MODA, to the Museum of Design Atlanta, and that was an incredible – that was the craft – activism exhibit it was great yeah um but i think that part of it so that part of it i would love for your advice and thoughts about that for the next round i think that's one of the areas that we really and i, I think there's people that want to help with that with those interviews yeah so that's good yep yep yeah so well the, the thoughts that come to mind immediately um we opened as you know with threads of resistance last summer yes it was amazing and we currently have up for just a couple more days the Migrant Quilt Project. Uh-huh. And both times the common negative comment was, you know, quilts should only be used for love and comfort. Why are you getting political with quilts? 
And a, and a very interesting historic um, thread that you might explore is how quilts have been used to express social comments, social concerns, and politics very early on. That's really the earliest. The earliest documented um, is in the collection of Historic New England, which would make a fantastic field trip for you. Uh-huh. And it um, it's attributed to Lydia Maria Child, who is a story within herself. And it was per, um, it was made for a anti slavery fair. the The raffling of it was documented, I think, in the Liberator. Um, Garrison's anti-slavery magazine and uh, Barbara it's very it's accessible on historic New England's website you Uh can look at it and Barbara Brackman has written about it in one of her civil war books but it expressed um, the evils of slavery it's a there's a verse in it's a very simple quilt it's an eastern star pattern a crib quilt size and it has a, a, a stanza from a poem about a slave mother having her baby torn from her arms and sold to a separate owner than she was being sold to. Oh, God. That, that's 1836, 1837. By the 1840s, women are using political ribbons, political uh, bandanas in quilts. And of course, you can, uh, there are just a couple. Whig Rose is one of them. And I think there's Whig defeat, which Whig was a political party, 1840s and 50s. Mm-hmm. And so there are different quilt patterns that are named for politics. And then you can go down a whole, another whole avenue about commemorative textiles being used in quilts. Early in the 19th century. So there's lots of cool stuff to explore there that leads right into your craftivism exhibit mm-hmm. that you saw. Yeah. But people just don't understand that that women have been making comments in there. And then um, I don't know how much detail you want from me now, but yeah. there's every, everything in the 20th century um, <clears throat> with, uh, let's see, there was the Boise Peace Quilt. Yeah. There was a quilt in 1975-ish that was made by a bunch of women concerned about the environment of the Hudson River. It's called the Hudson River Quilt. Um, 1989 or 90 was the founding of the Names Project, the yeah, AIDS Quilt. Right, huge. Yep, huge. Um, so quilts have been used. Um, there's not much up until the 1960s from 1900 to 1960 that unless you think of some of the fundraising quilts, but they're not political. Um both World War One and World War Two had fundraising quilts made. Interesting. And what were the fun? What, what was a fundraising quilt? So the, or I think one of the earliest documented for the, oh no, the, there's in for World War One there was a very popular magazine called the Modern Priscilla, and they published a pattern for a a Red Cross fundraising quilt, big Red Cross in the center. <clears throat> different ways to build the quilt but the point was to sell the opportunity to have your name inscribed in the fundraising quilt for 10 or 15 or 20 cents per signature interesting um, it's in sue reich's book uh world war one quilt susan reich r-e-i-c-h have you interviewed her yet no i haven't she'd be a good one to interview about world war one and world war two oh, i love it that's great. And then there's a lot of fundraising going on in the, ni- in the 19th century um, is when inscribed quilts begin to be used for fundraising, especially for churches. And you'll <clears throat> often see, I'm trying to think where, oh, that's not an art collection. Um, can't think whose collection it is, but there's a gorgeous inked center of what the church is going to look like once the money is raised. Mm-hmm. And then you, again, pay 5, 10, and 15 cents or 15 cents for a, a, an opportunity to have your name inscribed on the fundraising quilt. And how are they inscribed? How are they being inscribed? Ink. ink. The majority of them are ink. Um, some of the later ones at the end of the century into the 20th century, you'll find them embroidered over the, over the pencil of the ink, but the majority of them are inked. Interesting. And quite often they'll they'll purchase uh, their their name and one person will inscribe them so it's the same handwriting all over the quilt wow. 
Love it. Now, what about how, how let me just curious with the inscribed quilts, do you see inscribed quilts today? Has there, are people still doing inscribed quilts like that for fundraising? Yes. When I give my lecture, um, one of my lectures or two of my lectures have, you know, a brief comments about inscribed quilts, friendship quilts. There are so inscribed is like the umbrella word for friendship, album, signature, all those other names that we used to use for them. But us quilt history geeks are trying to get the same nomenclature used. So inscribed quilts covers a whole lot of territory. And I will ask my audience, how many of you, you you know, inscribe, we've been making friendship quilts forever. How many of you have participated? Many of them are made like to thank a a guild president when she retires. Mm -hmm. Um, Many of them are made for uh, block exchanges. Uh, There was a huge revival at the time of the um, millennium where people were swapping <clears throat> swapping signed blocks so and you ended up you, your goal was to make a quilt with 2000 different fabrics and or signatures or whatever on it to commemorate the millennium wow interesting and are the are the are the quilts already finished or are they they are they signing the blocks before they're put into the quilt they're signing the blocks before they put in the get put in the quilt. It would be quite difficult to get a decent hand on on a three layer quilt with a, yeah. with a batting in it. Interesting, huh? Interesting. Well, I totally love that idea. We're trying to figure out. That's, <laughs> I want to make one of those. I think that would be really fun. Um, all right. So let me ask you: What about the suffragette movement? We had talked about that before. Were they making quilts mm-hmm. as part of the votes for women, even in the suffrage no. or the suffragette period? They were out marching and getting themselves in jail. Interesting. We know of only two at this point, and it's, um, I think I mentioned it because I'm co-curating with Sandra Sider from the Texas Quilt Museum, Mm -hmm. an exhibit called Deeds, Not Words. We've invited, I think we're up to 30 quilt uh, quilt artists who will be responding to the theme. Uh, It's going to open in Paducah, in 2020 in so, at the National so. Quilt Museum and we'll have it at the New England Quilt Museum in August of 2020 which is the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage so we're trying to track down every suffrage quilt we can find and it's only going to be two or three wow um, Boston Museum of Fine Arts has one it's either the Met or the American Folk Art Museum has a second and in the next couple of months I've got to get my my rear end in gear and go go see them so cool. um and i'm doing some a lot of background reading because um sandra has asked me to we're gonna have a catalog for the exhibit and i'll be writing a short chapter on the history of the women's suffrage movement oh how cool so that's really my hot topic that's great oh you've got a great it's job fun. <laughs> oh yeah i hate my job <laughs> I like I hate, just like you hate your job elizabeth what just like you hate your job. Yeah, exactly. I have a cruddy job. It's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's very true. Um, well, that's super interesting. Um, what about the banners that the suffragettes were wearing? Are they Were they ever incorporated into uh, quilting? Not that I know of. Interesting. But that's a good research topic. I'll write that one down. Yeah, the banners too. I mean, they've got to be handmade, right? Uh maybe maybe by machine i have a technical question can you hear that lawnmower in the background no okay I, i'm not going to close the window anyway just stand by okay our neighbor's lawn service just turned up there we're good oh, that happens so that's really interesting I think that's awesome. Um, do you see, let me ask you a couple questions about this. So one of, when Mary Fonz was here, one of her sort of big things is to, to bring back the history and connect it to sort of the contemporary consumerist mindset of quilting. Do you, and Good. I just, right? And I think, do you feel like we live in a world that is sort of detached from the history of quilting? I mean, you're at the New England Quilt Museum, so people are coming to see quilts, but Sort of, what are your thoughts about the relationship between the past and the current world we live in? Uh, well, I do feel people are detached from it. They have um, 
very strong ideas about what what a quilt should be without understanding that history uh as as we learned from the only you know, the only negative comments about those two exhibits that could be considered controversial were about well quilt should be about love and comfort yeah um i think part of it is that there is a probably a smaller demographic than it used to be of people like me who started quilting in the 70s yeah and because we've been quilting so long our interest in the making has expanded to the history of the craft yeah that there makes are sense. so many people who are picking up quilting now as retired people in their 50s and 60s and 70s and they're really hot into the fabric uh, and again i asked this question in my many lectures giving another one tonight how many of you have been quilting for how long and so many people raise their hands i just started in my retirement i finally have time for it yeah i don't think there are very many people who jump into the craft thinking of the the history of it did you read this the morning's this this morning's new york times yeah had a very interesting article about using craft to ex, to escape from the political climate how to how to get i think it was like the headline was how to get friendly with with uh with the internet again and it talked about many crafts this writer's particular craft was um interest interest was pottery which he started it just a year ago but getting to the friendly side of the internet That's really learning crap yeah whether with your quilt any any mentioned quilting and how many people are using uh, YouTube and Craftsy to learn a craft yeah. and, f- and feeling better about their computers again. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. Well, we have this, big... yeah, and our group has been pretty apolitical. I mean, I my politics, I don't hide my politics. It's off on the website. I'm like, I wear pink hats. I make pink hats. <laughs> you know, like there's not, it's not even a question. But our group was pretty reasonable until like right around 4th of July, and then we had three incidents that happened all within the space of 24 hours, and I was traveling at the time. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, so first, we were doing our first sew-along, which is the Gypsy Wife sew-along by Jen King- Kingwell. Right. And it's a very complicated pattern, and we have a beginning law student doing it. So we're trying to make sure that beginners can follow along. And someone got upset thinking we had put too much of the measurements on. So we talked about that, and we... We regrouped and it was fine, but it, it exploded in this crazy like patterns are being stolen all the time. And I thought this was a copyright group, and it was like, well, you know, it, we're not a market substitution for it. And trying to explain how copyright works and it doesn't protect certain things, and it got into this really interesting conversation. So that part that seemed like okay, that's part of the experiment, and that was good. Then we had one of our quilting members who I adore, um, Tara Miller. She posted on 4th of July a quilt where she had used uh, antique flags in the quilt. That caused a bit of controversy. So I'm curious, that was the second one. And the third one had to do with my kid, and I'll talk, we can talk about that one in just a second. She's got a project she wants to do on migrant, on the immigrants. Um, yep. The stolen children, and um, or, or the missing children, um, and we posted that she had gotten a donation for a fabric for it, and she's got this whole vision of what it is. And someone said it got super political of like, didn't Trump already you know, fix that? And like, why are you doing this? And so we pulled that one really quickly, just because it was the kid, and we had to sort of think wow. through all of that. But that happened all within 24 hours, which was, and we got. Um, <laughs> I think an extra like 100, 150 people joined. It was so weird. It was like, like the internet is so odd. Like the controversy brought more people, but it mm-hmm. was changing the nature of the group. So we had to, I had to get all law professor on them and sort of calm it down a bit to say, you know, this is an experiment and we are friendly here and, um, and these are good conversations, but let's keep it, you know, reasonable. So I don't know. It was weird. Wow. Yeah. So flags, do you see quilts that people have used flags actual u.s flags in them um not large pieces what comes to mind part of the research that i did when i was working on my civil war quilts book was on the american flag 
Um, too often people will use, if they, if they see the representation of a flag in an antique quilt, they'll, they'll date it to the number of stars, and that's not always accurate. More often people will make a flag to go in a quilt rather than using a flag uh, that has, you know, a flag as part yeah. of a quilt. But I'm not, I have not kept up with whatever the contemporary quilt artists are, are doing. So part of my research was to learn that the flag was never standardized until the 1920s, 1926. Wow, really? Or 1930, yeah. And um, that's when a lot of the, are there law, <laughs> there are laws about the use of the flag and what you can do with it and how you're supposed to dispose of it and right. that sort of thing. There's laws, um, we've learned, there's laws, but no enforcement mechanism. Correct. So that's interesting, Correct. right? And then there's all the First Amendment on the other side of it, you know, expression exactly. and all that. So, so going back to the Civil War, there are two quilts that I know of that were made for Civil War soldiers because they requested flag quilts. Uh, one is in the collection of the Belfast, Maine Historical Society. The other one is privately owned, but both are pictured in my Civil War quilts book. Interesting. But as today, an artist using quilts, I would have to do some research on that to catch up. Yeah, so interesting, right? And it was yeah. a beautiful quilt. It was a, it was a beautiful quilt. Um, and I think I it, saw it, it was like um, I think I saw a picture of it. I did yeah, catch that, that, right? And I saw it in yeah. person. It's gorgeous. And it is there is a moment when you're like, oh my, right? <laughs> There's there's right. flags in here, <laughs> so um, really? I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know. So, so anyway. was there a lot of controversy over that one? Oh yes, much oh, controversy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so we the law students, of course, are now finishing up a paper on um, First Amendment and flags and and cases about using flags as part of you know something. Right. So. Yeah, you can't use, in the in the code it says things like you can't use them as napkins, which I thought was interesting. Like why napkins got in there, I'm not sure why, but wiping they, your face. Don't wipe your face with the flag. Don't wipe your face with the flag. Yeah, I guess you're right. There's a there's a bunch of exhibits that, that had used flags, like they put them all on the ground. You had to walk mm -hmm. across them. Things that you weren't mm -hmm. supposed to do, but um I haven't I don't know. We'll see if we can find some more things about art and flags um that isn't I mean, oh What's the thing? Something just flashed across Facebook within the last two or three days about somebody wearing a flag, making a flag, making a jacket out of a flag. Interesting. Where interesting. did I see that? So, yeah. So, I don't know. That was interesting. So, what else? Um, we are trying to figure out what we're supposed to do with our booth. We, I mean, we're going to do copyrighted stuff, but also thinking about how to explain copyright to people. We're getting some really good questions. Um, and thinking through how to teach it where it's not the way I teach it to the law students, you know, that it's really relevant to people's lives. One of the things we get is I found a quilt on Pinterest or I saw a quilt in a museum. I want to make my own version of it. I don't know how much I can use of the original, how much originality do I need. And I don't, mm -hmm. I'm curious what your thoughts are about that, about how close, um, it needs to be like how far away it needs to be how different does it need to be for it to not be infringing in your mind i really don't have an answer for you I and mean, it, it was a one of the original questions i asked you about yeah. our uh, uh, emily monroe quilt yeah um we've before a francie was licensed to before francie quinnett hoopla was was licensed to um to do that pattern, somebody made a pretty close copy of that Emily Monroe quilt. And I've got to go back and find the source, but someone's, someone's done a, a cross-stitch embroidery pattern of that quilt. That's interesting. And we've, and we've neither, we've, we've not explored taking any action in any, in any way because we don't have the resources to do so. Well, and also your quilts are, I mean, what, so one of the questions I always have is, yeah, when, is, when was the quilt? 1865. Yeah, so it's in the, I mean, it's in the public domain. I mean, unless you're going to claim that it's an unpublished work and blah, 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 blah. It's, you know, yeah. anything before 1923, generally, if it's been sold or, 
or gifted or given in a public man. And, you know, there's it's been circulating. It's out of copyright. Yeah. So right. then you can do anything you want with it. Right. right. That's, so, so there's there's the answer. Yeah. The question becomes when someone sees something on Pinterest, like, oh, someone makes a rainbow quilt uh, with hexes, and you think, oh, I want to make a rainbow quilt with hexes. That mm-hmm. seems totally fine. But then people are saying, but I want to also exhibit it at a quilt show. And the question then becomes tracing, like, how close can – what's Mm -hmm. originality what isn't is it original to that pinterest person like all those kinds of questions of like how close is it and that's not easy those are not easy answers i think Mm. Mm. the old stuff is easy (laughs) yeah yeah so we'll just keep collecting old quilts and not worry about it totally get inspired by old quilts that would be the that's my answer (laughs) (laughs) Go to the museum. That's the thing, right? Go Thank to the new so right. My, my, uh, my response to what you're going to do in your booth is, yeah. is before the book, your book is done on this. What yeah. about a simple handout? Yeah, I think we're going to do that. We're also thinking about yeah, handout is great, and also we're able to. It's really nice because we just we just got back from talking with. We went to Houston and and talked with Quilt Inc. and um, okay. we can have a gallery space to have seminars, and we also Ooh. will have a booth. Uh, so we kind of have three spaces. We'll have the the little the exhibit. I mean the interactive space. Um, maybe we'll do a inscription quilt or something. I don't know what we're going to do there. Um, then we're going to do. Um, we'll have a seminar space for lectures on different aspects of things, and um, and then we'll also have a like a in the exhibit part. They'll give us a space for doing interviews, so we can sort of pull people off the floor and do oh, cool. interviews. So yeah, it's a full. They've been really very kind to us, so it's um it's really gonna be. And great. who did you speak with? Um, to um a whole bunch of people, but um Bob, who we who is the yep. um yeah Bob um was sort of the one who I've been always dealing with. But there's also Becky and others there that are. Did you meet Carrie herself? No, I didn't. I did not. Um, do you yes. know Carrie? I do. Hmm. Quite a lady. She's a wonderful person. She's done so much for our world. In what way? So Carrie's the one that began Quilt Sync, right? And began the Quilt Festival. Um, was Houston the first festival or show in, is it like 75? Was that the first time we had one of those? We're coming on to 40 years, so it has to be. Yeah. Uh, well, so it wasn't as early as 75. So the biggest thing to me, because I was, before my life as a curator, I was a business person, is she has been instrumental in measuring our world. Um, Quilts Incorporated and it used to be Quilters Newsletter or Prime Media. I'm not sure who her partner is now. <clears throat> Do every other year they measure the quilt industry. How many billions of dollars? How many millions of people are quilting? What is our average age? What is our economic and our educational demographic? All that wonderful stuff. So we know who our audience is. Yeah. And and to me that's a very important thing. Huge. And then to, to elevate quilting i she didn't do it by herself we were already traveling for quilting but so many people now just love to go to houston or they love to go to paducah making making quilt events at quilt con making quilt events destination destinations hugely yeah yeah well when we we sent a team to paducah this year it was awesome um and uh QuiltCon and uh, something else. I can't remember. Anyway, but yeah, it's amazing to see these things. I mean, they're growing and, and, and all that. I mean, they're so mm-hmm. important part of the, the quilting experience at this point. When did the New England Quilt Museum begin? You know what? You've caught me off. I think it's, it's either 87 or 89. That's really interesting. Uh, it was, so what happened first is a, is a bunch of people got together and decided that we needed a New England quilt guild to sort of coordinate all the efforts of the many quilt guilds that popped up around, around the region. And then early on, I think somebody hatched the idea that, we, that the New England Quilt Guild should form a museum. And I believe, the reason I get confused is because there was a board of directors meeting at which that was voted And that was probably 87, but the museum didn't formally open until 89 in rented space in the basement in one of the mill buildings in Lowell. And what do you see as the goal of the museum? 
Well, our, our stated, our byline is to educate and inspire. <laughs> I and like I that. Those, well, you know what? It's really simple and it's what we do. Yeah. And talking about this, the, the, the history part, we ought to be the best vehicle along with other quilt museums to explain to people why quilting is important in what ways for how long. Yeah. And to have them walk in the door and go, wow. Yeah, it's Isn't great. this amazing craft? Yeah. And, how, and, and the inspiration part might be, that's a gorgeous piece of art, or how do I learn to make that? Yeah. And how do you choose the exhibits? Like, what, what are you looking for? Or when you design an exhibit, what, what's sort of the goal of that part of it? So I look for exhibits that will knock people's socks off. What, what we're learning, our, um, our attendance very thankfully has been increasing over the past three or four years because I think we got the formula right. People want to see extraordinary, traditional, contemporary quilts made today. My education part is helping um, the person who I very respectfully call Susie Quilter, who likes to quilt, who likes to be inspired, but who um, I hope will broaden her horizons to understand and appreciate quilts as art. Um, I've got a particular project in mind that we're going to open this fall. It's called Explorations. Um, Allison Wilbur, who is another person, if you haven't interviewed, no. yeah, she, I haven't. she is um, a mover and shaker in SAQWA, the Studio Art Quilt Association regional group in um, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and uh, I think it's Connecticut are there three. I get them scrambled up all the time. SAQWA has regional, <clears throat> regional groupings, and I think that's hers. She, she came in one day, made an appointment to, um, to um, ask me for an exhibit, if I wanted one of her exhibits. And I said, no, thank you, not yet for this, uh, this one, Allison, but I've, got, I've been cooking an idea, and, I, and, I, and she jumped right on it. We're going to have Explorations 1 and Explorations 2. And in each grouping, 12 artists will be represented, and each one has been juried to present a particular technique so you'll walk into the into our gallery and you will see 12 art quilts and hanging beside each art quilt is a a it's a fabric it's going to be a fabric poster um, a picture of the artist perhaps a picture of her studio but let's say she's doing uh, machine thread painting mm -hmm. there'll be a series of images on that secondary poster that explains how to do it or how she does it oh, that's great and i'm really excited about it because i want art quilts to be more accessible to Susie quilter that's really great and so that's our educate and inspire all rolled into one exhibit yeah um other exhibits we choose because so i do we do eight exhibits a year um, four in the what we call the main or the gray galleries and four in the classroom or the white gallery. And I choose them by that criteria. Um, what's an extraordinary contemporary traditional quilt look like? Well, how about the competition quilts that come out of the um, biennial Japanese Handicraft Instructors Association in Tokyo? we have record attendance during that exhibit because the quilts are knock your socks off technically amazing you've seen the japanese quilts yeah they're stuff. amazing right they're amazing yeah um but they also have a an art category and so i choose half and half from each i've had the privilege of curating that for the past two years two years and i um, i'm about to dig into the next one which will show in our galleries in january of 2020 um, we, I'm looking now, um, what was very popular, I found a, 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 a woman I've known forever had enough quilts to fill the classroom gallery. Her name is Gladdy Porsche. Another person you should, when you come to New Hampshire, let me know. Gladdy, yeah. Gladdy should be on, Gladdy should be on your short list. Gladdy Porsche. Um, <clears throat> Gladdy Porsche, P-O-R-C-S-C-H-E. 
Um, she's got a great blog and a great website. Cool. Um, her her traditional quilts are just a, they're transformed by her brilliant color work. Um, we have and then I then I'll I'll rent exhibits from Sakwa. Um, I I had a group of art quilters from California a couple of years ago for an exhibit called um, Confluence. I will curate one or two exhibits a year. I just deinstalled one of my personal favorites. Um, I have been quilting since the 70s and was very interested in art quilts from the beginning and fell in love with the work of a woman named Molly Upton. And Molly um, committed suicide in her 20s, but before she did, she created an amazing body of work. She had a... um, a, a dear friend, Susan Hoffman, who worked beside her and has continued to make wonderful quilts, and they began their work in 1974. And we've been doing a series of exhibits um, called The Quilted Canvas on New England's Early Art Quilters. Oh, cool. And what I was able to do with this exhibit is show people how art quilts were so elegant and simple in the beginning of these women's work and how the quilting was minimal and when quilting is minimal it just is a completely different experience the way the the broad ranging quilting lines it creates a bar relief that's just so different from what's being done today really interesting and i included as much um uh as much information about both young women but had the joy of being able to use Susan Hoffman's memories and words about how the two of them, um, they, they lived in this big old house in separate rooms in Cambridge, and they took the world by storm, convincing people that quilts are art. That's They're really not just a bit. And they, they did a wonderful job. And I photographed it very carefully. I've got to figure out a way to, to put it up on a blog somewhere so people can experience it. That's really cool. That sounds but amazing. They were also they were also influenced by traditional quilting and its t- quilt patterns and it's so interesting to see how they took a quilt pattern and instead of repeating it over the surface of a of a of a large quilt, they blew up one block and used that block and the different fabrics within it to create just a, a fabric painting for the wall. That's so cool. Love it. It is. So the next exhibit that I'm curating um, happens at this time next year. It's going to be called called In Praise of Silk. Um, I did silk before, five years ago, as a a really dedicated time span exhibit, where I had a quilt from 1780 that was made um, for the the rich trade in Salem, Massachusetts, all the way to... um, Beth Ann Nemish's work, White Arbor Quilting. She does amazing machine quilting on silk. And I'm going to repeat parts of that, but looking for more pieces from the same artists and then different artists. And I probably will include a few 19th century silk quilts if they translate as op art or or pretty strong wall statements. That sounds great. So that's the next one I'm curating next spring. I love it. It's really, that sounds great. That sounds really great. So to educate um, people about sewing with silk and the history of silk and, you know, we, we weave in history whenever we can. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so we're on year two of the project. And since year one was so successful in part because you helped me figure out what questions to be asking, I'm going to ask you, what questions should we ask for year two? What kinds of things should we be looking at that I might not think about in terms of the industry or anything history quilting charity quilting what comes to mind that I might not think about in terms of this world that too hard a question no not I have I have too many answers okay, I can go for it I can, I can answer it from my point of view as a museum curator okay what kind of bells and whistles do I have to add to exhibitions to get more people in my doors Um, So the biggest one right now is we can't get the Boston media interested in our exhibit as a place to go see art. 
and and I've been banging my head and banging my head and banging my head trying to get Jared Bowen or who's the uh, WGBH arts arts editor or the Boston Globe arts editor to to just take a look at us. I mean, the Japanese quilts, the threads of resistance. Boss, the Boston media should have been all over it. Totally, um, that's ridiculous. It, that's I mean, that... it, it's totally ridiculous. So how do we get pe- uh, how do we get the art world to take us seriously? Yeah. How's that for a start? That's a really good one. Right. And why is it important? I think, it ha- ha- so is it, is it still this divide between craft and art or women's work yes. and all of that? Is it, do you still see that as a barrier? Oh, God. Didn't you send, I've had about 15 people send me the article from the Boston Globe about quilts being, um, not Boston Globe, New York Times, quilts being uh, influencing fashion this year mm-hmm. again. And the person who wrote the article, I would have, I wish I could have jumped into the paper and strangled him because here we go again, another freaking byline that starts, these are not your grandmother's quilts. Right. Or boring stuff comes out of the attic and it's yeah. a quilt. I could have killed that writer. Right. Um, I took the time to write a, a, a letter to the editor, which of course wasn't accepted, but there is always this thing if you write a, an interesting and our little news our little tv station did it there's an art quilter in harrisville new hampshire who makes amazing stuff and the excuse me i won't swear on your podcast you can swear because our, our numbers go up when i have to say explicit so go for it <laughs> so the funny. fucking commentator starts yeah. it again these are not your grandmother's quilts yeah. and i wanted to march into the, the studio in manchester and cram a fucking quilt down his throat yeah because yeah. I'm just, oh, I am angry. This this is what makes me mad is yeah. this, this divide. It's on the wall. Yeah. Can you please judge it by the aesthetic and not what it's made of? Yeah. And, you know, the, these quilts that I, it doesn't, like, you can go the range of, like, whatever time period to, from the protest quilts all the way back to, you know, quilts from the 1830s and earlier. And they're stunning. They're amazing. They take your breath away. They are art. They are... They are, it's incredible, right? They're just like, um, yeah. I mean, the, it like people are just not paying attention. I mean, they're just like, or it's blind. It's willful blindness because it's um, willful blindness. They it's will ridiculous. not open their eyes, and they will not get past the cloth. Yeah, and it's like they they really think um, somebody, some major person at our institution. I was talking to him about the project, and they were like, yeah. And you could just see that, like, they thought of it as, like, oh, well, some some of those old ladies are quilting. And it's like, Thank no. You. Right? Like, yeah, some old ladies are quilting. Sure. But a lot of people are quilting. And those old ladies may be making protest quilts. So just, you know, stop judging us um, and ignoring us. Um, sort of being underestimated is I sometimes... like I like that. I like that willful blindness, Elizabeth. That's just what it is. It is. And it's rude. And there's no place for it, you know? So, yep. so okay, that's interesting. Um, and I hear sort of, uh, do you feel like if more artists were doing quilting, like like general artists, like non-quilting artists were taking up quilting as a medium, that would improve the, the space of quilting? Like that we need to get contemporary famous quilters to be like, hey, Come use a long arm and see what you do with this instead of your or tattoo people or sort of you know. <laughs> um, the concern that I have is is young people. How do we get more kids quilting? Yeah, and I I, I think it's internet related. Yeah. Um, what are some of these maker apps on your yeah. on your iPhone? I know a lot of kids are 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 getting excited about craft because they can get. Get in, get the apps on their on their iPhone or on YouTube and see yeah. how to do that. Okay, so um, we I had this experience. I have to tell you this. So we were traveling, as you know, and we stopped at um at a shop that had donated. Um, we had a long arm um, partially donated to us, which was really nice. So we stopped at the shop to thank them, and they had this cool. um, brother embroidery machine that's like gazillion dollars, right? Very expensive one, but it allows you to scan um, artwork, and then um, it. It, embroider, it does the embroidery. And so we had um, my kid and her friend, who's an artist um, and at, at uh, an art school for high school, 
Um, so the owner made a heart on this piece of paper and then I handed it to the kid I'm like hey can you do something with it and within like five minutes it made this amazing thing and so um, we scanned it and then it took about an hour because it was very intricate for it to be done and they these two watching this happen they were like had thousands of ideas of how they would use this machine so you know part of our next vision of our project is creating a maker space in New Orleans especially where you could invite youth in you could invite artists in all kinds of people to use the equipment to see yep. like what happens I keep saying like it's if you give a mouse a cookie you know that book if you give a mouse a cookie yes. they ask for a glass of milk so if you give artists yes. and you give kids a muffin yeah exactly <laughs> I say that about my dad all the time because he's like uh, if I give him like hey you want some breakfast he's like sure and like can I have this too so he lives with me. Yeah. So I'm always like, I always am like putting my finger at him. If you give him as a cookie, like, cause he always wants more stuff. But I feel like, like how to get to the youth is to have spaces for them to be using this incredible equipment to be yep. designing and using it because the long arms are amazing and the computerized long arms are amazing and the embroidery machines and having people that can say, here's how you thread paint and just having it there and available to them. So that's like our next big project is to try to get a space and donation of equipment and materials to allow um, artists and kids to come in and young people and older people um, and just experience it. So that, that is the next big aspect of this project is to think through. And we have, we found a space we really want um, in the Bywater. We'll see if we can raise the money, but um that's I think that's that's the key. Getting these tools in in the hands of people, um, young people, yep. just watch them do whatever they can do. You know, I I think it would be amazing. So so what comes to mind immediately is the death of quilt shops. Yeah. Should quilt shops be encouraged to think that way, and they won't go to de- they won't die so quickly? I don't know. I'm kind of interested about the anatomy of the quilt shop. I'm in, I'm interested in sort of the economics of a quilt shop, um, yep. and I'm also really amazed that there are all still independent quilt shops. Like it's like yep. the last vestige of independent. In, like the idea we have all these teeny tiny quilt shops all over the country that are not in a network or anything like that um, is really surprising to me, mm-hmm. um, considering the rest of our world. Um, so I'm not sure right. how that happened, um, and I'm not saying that in a negative way. I'm just like it's curious. So is there no National Quilt Shop Association? I don't know. I haven't seen that yet. I mean, they might be, but I'm not, but they're, I mean, all the little quilt shops are sort of, they're so like independent and they, sometimes they work with each other, but often not. And sometimes they feel in competition with the local ones. Um, Right. And it's weird. Um, and that they're all reinventing the wheel over and over again. Now, I mean, there's Facebook groups for them and there's other things, you know what I mean? There isn't, there isn't resources. Um, but I don't know. I really feel like what I'm thinking about with this project is it's not a shop. It's like more like a gym that we think about this incredibly expensive equipment and that you right. may have a gym membership. And then if you're an artist, a kid, you have a youth membership or you are encouraged by if you're, you know, whatever, like um, that it's a space to, to come and work out and, and spend time and learn a new skill um, and then it's not classes and it's not, it's like going to a gym. Um, right. And I don't know. I don't know if that'll happen. I also see it as potentially a destination vacation that you could add on and just hang out with locals and hang out with people and quilt, um, and come for the, come for a couple of days, you know, be here for a convention, but then also just be like, Oh, let's go to the, the clubhouse that just want to quilt clubhouse and, and hang out and just do stuff. You know, so I don't know. We'll see if it, that's, that's what I pitched to the provost. <laughs> he was a little confused. Right. There, <laughs> so. there are, um, in Lowell and in, in, I think in Manchester, New Hampshire, there are a couple of, of things that are co- being called maker spaces. And they exactly, have, um, exactly. Right. Mostly, but yeah. mostly woodworking. Nobody that I know of has a big quilting machine. Exactly. I want a quilt. I want a quilt and craft maker space. And, yep. you know, we have a maker space on campus. That's all of like, like very well all the biomedical engineering kids you know it's very boy space and they were like well we can put you in there and I'm like you better ask them first <laughs> you know, like, yeah. they're not going to be happy with us being there um but yeah that was my argument was like you know this is kind of very much Virginia Woolf a room of one's own like if we have a maker space a quilting copy a quilting and crafting maker space 
Um, and that this could be something that could be adapted for lots of places. Like if it worked here, um, that's how you get, get people. It's the it's the socioeconomic aspect of it that kind of troubles me. You have to have yep. a certain level of earning power to be able to have a really awesome machine. Mm-hmm. But if you had a gym membership and or you know a club club membership, you wouldn't have to have that. And the materials right. would be there, and you would just make stuff. Mm. That's the idea. Mm. So right now it's in my house. So it's <laughs> we have the long arm, and we have some machines, and people show up and hang out, and it's freaking my my teen out a bit. So um, we need to get it out of the house. But right now, yeah, people come over on Thursdays and Fridays and hang out and cool. play on the the long arm. Because it really is about playing. You don't want to like yeah. just rent time because then you're just like, you want to just come and play and feel like there's somebody right. else like hanging out with you and kibitzing and talking about like what's happening and you know what I mean? Like it, it that's part of the experience. So, yeah. so yeah, that's, and then the law side of it. So, um, we found a lot of quilt entrepreneurs out there, a lot of people making businesses well. You know, either they're retired or the kids are napping or whatever it is. They've gotten, their hobby has gotten, like, they're super hobbyist that it turns into a business and then they're thinking through, like, what kind of company am I going to be? What about trademark? Or I have an invention. And we just got certified last year from the USPTO to to offer at Tulane pro bono services for trademark and patents. Um, and cool. so it would be adding into the clubhouse component um, resources for quilt entrepreneurs so that they could get you still have to pay the government fees which are like you know 70 under 300 dollars most of the time for like what you're doing but you wouldn't have any um lawyer fees so that's right. another component of it is um making this stuff available to a wide variety of people so mm-hmm. So that's where the that's cool. where the project's going. Keep the pro, and then the last part is the podcast. So we we really want it. We have research sponsors. We have great research sponsors now. Um, lots of famous names that are giving us um, re- um, product, which is super great. Um, but I think the next step is sponsorship, so that we can get some money in um, yep. to support the clubhouse and other things. And that's getting the podcast numbers up, so that we can get. We need to get about a thousand viewers uh per episode to really be viable for significant um sponsor money so that's where we're at we're close we're getting there um but um but that's the next step is to really get money in i would love for the clubhouse like to purchase the land i mean to purchase the building that we want and to be in the clear so we don't have to worry about making rent or making um mortgage so that we can really do what we want to do with it so that's the kind of goal to to buy it outright so which is a challenge, but that's our next big challenge. Raise a lot of money. <laughs> oh, but what, a, what a fantastic outcome for this project, Elizabeth. You must be so excited. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of remarkable, and it's growing in this crazy way. So other people are going to start interviewing, and um, I've just learned so much, and now sort of thinking through the next steps. I think the last part of it is thinking through how to write about it, and I think that we're now thinking about having it as a very beautiful, but a, um, a workbook. So learning copyright and IP would be like a workbook that you would either, either you'd make a quilt by the end or that you just do the workbook pages so that um, you could really gear it towards guilds so that they could have like a IP or a copyright um, like 10 minutes each time yep. with an instruction instructor's manual, but have it as something that people can kind of work through as opposed to thinking that just, just read it. Um, so we're working, the students and I are working on that um, that's this summer. That's fantastic. That's, yeah. that's, that's the way I learned. That's so much better. Yeah. I think it needs to be hands-on workbook, like, yep. you know, thinking through what a workbook is um, when <clears throat> trying to explain yep. this. So, um, And again, I think that the guilds get... Um, the guilds get the biggest bad rap of, oh, they're stealing patterns and they don't understand and blah, 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 blah. And they may or may not be doing that. But I have to say that they're also the place of education and they're where mm-hmm. norms will change so or norms mm-hmm. will get instilled. And when I've been at guilds now and I ask them, like, when does it matter? When does copyright matter? And I explain to them and I present it through quilting, quilts that I've made. They get it really fast. So I yep. think that it's just helping them ex- understand it's an economic system and sort of right of attribution, 
um, and when does that matter? So we're working on that this summer as our next big project. Of boy, I'll tell you what I'd love to. I'm looking for new new talks to give. I'm yeah. working on a couple, but boy, if you could get me educated enough so that I could talk about that for 20 minutes, I would love it. I, because you know I don't travel, <laughs> so yeah, I travel well, very. I travel slowly by train. So <laughs> I um I speak to I love fifteen it. to twenty quilt guilds a year. Wow, that's great. And all right, all right, here you go, Elizabeth. How can you use so the New England Quilt Museum? Yeah, maybe unique in our in our makeup. Yeah, we have. We have supporting guilds from all over New England. That's so cool. How can you use us to get that information it. out to those guilds? Let's figure this out. I think it would be great. And also using some of your collection as examples would be super yep. great too. Um, yeah, yep. I think it would be awesome. Um, let's figure this out. Uh, definitely. And I would love for you to be an ambassador for this and to be just out there talking about it. Because as I said, like I don't go very far from home. Right. So, um, right. yeah, no, unless I think it would be amazing. Can, unless a train goes there. Exactly. <laughs> the so I have one, one thing to say about the guilds, what I've been noticing. Yeah. Um, I have been noticing more and more that the guilds are, are asking permission from yeah. um, designers when they choose a quilt for their raffle. Yeah. I have been noticing more and more that, uh, well, for instance, um, I went to two guild shows this year where they were required to put the pattern source for the quilt they were exhibiting. That's really interesting. Well, and, and also, yeah, that's amazing. We do we do an exhibit called, um, it, we do it every other summer, called the Best of New England Quilt Guilds. And they are required, if it, unless it's, an, they're required to state whether it's an original pattern, inspired by whatever artist, mm-hmm. or if it's directly taken from a pattern. And I did kind of a, a cranky. It's happened. T- we've done it twice. Two two exhibits of this now. It's happened it. both times. Two people use the same pattern and come up to come up with quilts that were very very similar. So I hang them. I hung them side by side. That's fantastic. Do you have that and form people, that you? Can you send me the form that you use? Because I'd be really interested. Yeah. Because I think that's a perfect way. People just. I just got something on our Facebook group about that. Like I'm inspired by it. What What happens? And I think what we need to do is help people understand like what is original, what is inspired by, what is directly yeah. taken. But that language is per- yeah. perfect um, for really yeah. understanding the sort of layers of um, creativity. You know. I will email our executive director who manages that form and, and copy you in the, awesome. in the email and have her send you that form. I would love it. Well, um, we will definitely let, well, as we go and think about this workbook, um, you know, we want it to be simple. We also want it to be um, uh, usable and that they really get that. The other thing we're doing, two other things we're doing. One is um, for the pattern makers, we found that their copyright notices are kind of crappy. So they, 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 yeah. they're all over the map. Um, so we're doing a best practices on copyright notices and what they should be including in that. Um, and we'll do that as a um, white, like white paper that we'll put out for free. Um, so pattern makers can put that, make choices, almost like Creative Commons license, but for quilters that yep. says, you know, if you're Guild X, if you are going to sell it this, like, you know, if you, you, you know, or no restrictions or please, you know, include my name that it's in that you whatever so that they have on their notice what they really want to happen and also yep. contact information if they want to be contacted um so that people can you know be good citizens so right. we're working on that one too perfect yeah so that's it that's those are our our big things at this point so awesome. i don't know so yeah it's a year it's amazing it's totally amazing so today is exactly the kind of day that it was when you and and the kid came to visit really it's beautiful low humidity bright blue sky not too hot and it's just a perfect day i I spent an hour and a half in the garden this morning and then i set my timer so that i would have to come back inside and i'm trying to muck out my office today so i can get back to writing ah that's so awesome and what are you working on now are you working on the suffrage stuff or what are you working on i'm working on three or four things always at once i still i'm five years behind in my potholder book i'm four <laughs> years behind in the museum book but i've been pecking away at some of the chapters 
And then I am working in the suffrage thing, and I'm supposed to be writing a chapter. Um, Lori Labar at the Maine State Museum is mm-hmm. doing an exhibit on Maine quilts in three years from now. And she and I are going to be doing a chapter. We've uncovered the most amazing collection of, of inscribed quilts from the Cumberland County area, which is which like surrounds Portland, Maine. I think we're up to 22 related quilts in this wow. grouping. That and what do you mean 18... related? What do you mean by related quilts? So they're all inscribed quilts, and they're related in that there's a crossover from families, family members from one quilt to the next. Sometimes it's and, and there's no person who signed all 22, but there are groupings of probably four or five prominent families whose sisters and mothers and cousins and aunts have signed the various quilts. Um, four of them, is that correct? Through one, two, three. Three of them are Civil War quilts made for fundraising. Uh, one is a sea captain's quilt um, that was made in 1867, and I had a blast re- uh, trying to find out what ship it was and about the sea captain and why it was made in 1867, which is, um, with, with all kinds of research, found out that he was made captain that year. Um, and so they're related in that they share many characteristics. Five of them have the same image of the Portland Observatory, which is a major um, major lands- uh, landmark in Portland. Uh, but they're just there's a lot of crossovers between why they were made and who they were made for. That's Three amazing. or four of them were made for sea captains. Um, others were made by the Cumberland Ladies Sewing Circle and different members around that church. Uh, and it's just it's just been so much fun doing the research. And that's my problem. I love to do research and I have a hard time stopping and, that's and really getting cool. the writing. Love it. I totally love it. Oh, that's so cool. It's wicked fun for old ladies with gray hair who don't know how to quilt except to make ugly quilts that come out of the attic and nobody watches. Love her. That's nobody right. Counts that's all we are. That's right. Just right. grandma's quilting. Over. <laughs> oh, my over. goodness. Well, awesome. Uh, okay, well, let's um, let's stop here. Hold on while I uh, don't hang up, and I'm going to stop. Thanks again, Pam, for doing this. It means a lot. Uh, it really does. I enjoy it. And um, are, are we still recording? I want to know how you're doing personally. Yeah, hold on a sec. So this is Elizabeth Townsend Guard. You've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. We want to hear from you. Join our army, our quilting army. Go to our Facebook page. Suggest people to be interviewed. Suggest yourself to be interviewed. We are excited to hear from you. But most importantly, I hope you get a chance to quilt today.